so today we're looking at 4.8, evaporation and transpiration. So if you remember, transpiration is the water loss from the leaf. And we know already the structure of our leaf, and we know that, of course, water is lost through the stomata into the air. But the true story of water loss starts at the root. So we know that water moves from the soil into the root hair cells, and that is by osmosis. Eventually, it's going to get to our tube, the xylem. And osmosis has to stop. Because if you remember, the one key thing about osmosis is the movement across a semi-permeable membrane. And in the xylem, there aren't any membranes. So how does the water molecule move up through this tube? In a plant like this, you might think it's no big deal. But actually, if you think about some of the redwood trees, for example, in California and Canada, they're absolutely huge. Hundreds of metres tall, and a, the water has got to move up against gravity. So how does that actually happen? So first we have to look at the dipolar nature of a water molecule. We all know that water is H2O. Let's draw that out. Now it's described as a dipolar molecule. Di means two and polar means it has a charge. And what actually happens is that the hydrogen ions have a slight positive charge and the oxygen has a slight negative charge. Overall, the molecule has no charge, but the unusual properties of water is because within the molecule, you get a slight difference of charge. So what difference does this make with the water molecule? Well, what actually happens is, you end up with forces of attraction between the hydrogen molecules and the other oxygen molecules. So if I draw another one here, it kind of looks like this, and there's a force of attraction. It's weaker than a covalent bond that you'll have learned about in chemistry. It's about a tenth of a covalent bond in terms of its strength. But overall, because there's so many of them, it creates quite a tension. So that hydrogen is attracted to that oxygen because that hydrogen has got a slight po positive charge and the oxygen has got a slight negative. Over here, it would be the same thing. So what we end up with is a tension, a surface tension with water that you don't see with any other molecules. As you can see, these water molecules are all joined together. If I was able to grab this end of the water molecule and pull it, this would pull this, would pull this, and what we end up with is a stream of water molecules that later we'll learn are called the transpiration stream. And in this context, because we're talking about it in, um, with regards to transpiration, these forces of attraction, they're caused by hydrogen bonds, but we call them cohesion tension. So these are cohesive forces created by water molecules. I'm going to demonstrate the surface tension property of water with this little experiment, which is really fun to try at home, especially if you've got a younger brother or sister. I've dyed the water red, just so that you can see it, and I'm gonna fill it all the way to the top, uh, like so. Now you'll have seen on films, if not in real life, pond skaters. Pond skaters are little insects that walk on the surface of water, almost like there's a film across it, a film being a layer. So here's my water. I'm going to pop that on there, make sure it makes connection with the water, and then I'm gonna turn it over, and then I'm gonna let go. And the surface tension of that water is strong enough to hold that piece of laminated card in place. So, uh, obviously you know that milk isn't made of H2O, so I filled up the gas jar with milk, and we're sticking the laminating card over the top. Obviously I'm not as um, confident with this one, which is why I'm near the sink. And if I turn over, it's just not the same. So before we can consider what happens at the root, we actually need to go back to the leaf and think about some of the processes that are happening here. Clearly this is our xylem, 
and this is what brings water up from the root to the leaf. As the water is in the xylem and it moves from cell to cell, what would be the name of the process by which that water moves across those cell membranes? The process is osmosis. It's moving from a higher concentration of water to a lower concentration across a partially permeable membrane. So the water continues to move and it gets to all the other cells and it comes down here. Now, eventually the water has got to be lost outside of the stoma. So let's consider how the water moves from this cell into these air spaces and what the name of that process is. The name of the process is evaporation. It's water here, it's moving in a liquid form, it's moving to a gaseous form, so that is what we know as evaporation. And then of course we have to consider when we've got a lot of water here, a high concentration of water and a lower concentration of water here, what's the name of the process whereby water moves out of the stomata? And of course it is diffusion, moving from a high concentration to a low concentration down a concentration gradient. So now we know that's how a leaf loses water, we want to ask the question, why? Why would a leaf go to all this trouble just to lose water? And you might remember back to some of the earlier pages where we talked about the leaf needs water, of course, for the process of photosynthesis, where carbon dioxide is joined with water to make uh, glucose, which is later built into starch, and oxygen. So we need water for that, but we also need mineral ions. We need magnesium to make chlorophyll, and we need nitrate for the growth of the plant. So this is how water is pulled from the xylem into the cells of the leaf. But how is water moved up the xylem? And it takes us back to this. When a piece, when a molecule of water moves from here to there, it actually creates a tension, it creates a pull that pulls the next water molecule up. That pulls the next one and the next one and so on. So we end up with this transpiration stream. Going back to the root, down here, as one molecule of water moves in from a root hair cell into the xylem, then you've lowered the amount, of the amount of water inside this cell, so more will move in by osmosis from the soil. So thinking about our transpiration stream, which is our water molecules pulling each of them up, creating a tension, creating a pull, this of course is all taking place in the xylem vessel. And there's an additional force that's taken place there. We haven't just got cohesion behind the molecules, between the molecules, we've got something called adhesion between the molecule and the wall. So I like to think of it as, when you think back to those chimney sweeps, those little boys that used to shimmy up chimneys and they'd have a hand and a hand and a, and a leg on each part, each side of the wall, that's how the water molecules are behaving. Because if you cut the stem, if you cut the xylem vessels, all the water doesn't just fall out the bottom. It remains there because you have these weak forces of attraction with the wall. Okay, I want to investigate the number of stomata on the back of a leaf. In fact, I want to estimate the stomata density. I want to be able to give my result per square centimetre of a leaf rather than this leaf compared to that leaf, because I might have different sizes of leaf, so it wouldn't be fair to compare two different sized leaves with the number of stomata. So I want an answer that gives me per centimetre squared. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take my leaf, I'm going to apply some nail varnish, some clear nail varnish to the back of the leaf. The reason why I'm doing it on the back of the leaf is of course because we don't find stomata <clears throat> on the upper side of the leaf, or if we do, there's very few of them. I'm gonna put the nail varnish in three 
different places. Whoops, this one's falling apart. And because I'm going to do this, I'm going to do repeats. Because if you remember, repeats, reliability. If I do repeats, I can discard anomalies. I can calculate a mean and I can get more reliable results. I'm going to leave that to dry for a moment. Now, while that's drying, what's actually happened is when I put it on top of uh, the surface of the leaf there, on the underside, it's sunk into the stomata and therefore it's, it's created like, a, uh, like an impression. It's almost um, like a, a cast of the underside of that leaf. But I can't see it here. I need to look at it under the microscope. Just make sure that's dry. When you're looking through your microscope at times 400, your field of view, let's just say that the field of view, the area of the leaf that you're actually looking at is one millimeter squared. It's not, but just for ease of calculation, let's pretend it is. So what we're then gonna do is we're going to count how many stomata I might see, and we'll find out how many is in one millimeter squared, and then we'll multiply that up. Okay, I'm removing some sellotape, and I'm being really careful not to get my fingerprints all over it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place it on the space where I place my nail varnish, and then I'm going to carefully peel it away. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring the nail varnish with it. So now I've got a cast of my stomata. Of course it doesn't look very much at the moment but I'm going to put it on a slide and I might just hook one end underneath there, remove my microscope clips and pop that in so that it is directly underneath the lowest power magnification. I also want to make sure that that's nice and tight so that it's taut so that when I get my image it's not three-dimensional it's flat and then I can get the whole field of view in focus. So I counted four, four stomata on my field of view. So that means one millimeter squared has got four. So therefore, what I need to do is have a think about how many millimeter squared there are in one centimeter squared. And of course, there's a hundred. So if I take four, if I take a millimeter and turn it into a centimeter, squared I've got to times it by 100 so therefore I need to times this by 102 and therefore in one centimeter squared there are approximately 400 stomata. Of course why am I comparing it per centimeter on one leaf, per centimeter squared on one leaf and per centimeter squared on the other? It's so that com comparisons between the density of stomata can take place because if you just counted it as a whole leaf one leaf is bigger than the other, it's not a fair comparison. So if I wanted to represent the density of stomata per leaf, I'm going to take my leaf and I'm going to draw around it. Oops. And then what I need to do is work out how many millimetres squared I've got there. I know that there are a hundred square millimeters in a square centimeter because if we think about it here is our one centimeter one centimeter that's a centimeter squared so then if I divide this into ten one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten why because there's ten millimeters one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and the same the other way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I've got a hundred squares, and each one of them measures one millimeter by one millimeter. I looked at this graph paper, one centimeter by one centimeter is represented by a box like this. However, the 
grading of the graph paper has just shown that uh, there are five individual marks in between each centimetre, which means that each one of these boxes is two millimetres. So that makes it a bit difficult for me to count in millimetres. So that means I'm just going to count whole boxes. So there's one, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I'll count them as fourteen. I'll count that as fifteen because we've got these bits here. I'll count this as sixteen with this bit and this one as seventeen. And this one and this little piece here, I'm going to call that eighteen. So I've got eighteen centimetres squared. Okay, so my leaf, the underside of my leaf is 18 centimetres squared. And we've already established that there are 100 millimetres squared in one centimetre squared. So now, to convert that into millimetres, all I'm going to do is say 1,800 millimetres squared. That's how many I've got because I've changed that into millimetres squared. When we looked at our field of view, I asked you to imagine that that field of view was equal to one millimetre squared. Within that field of view, we saw four stomata. So that means every millimetre squared, in theory, should have four stomata. So therefore, to work out how many of these we've got in there, I need to times that by 1,800. Likewise, I need to times the number 4 by 1,800 also. So that's going to give me 72, 7,200. So we're basically saying that on the underside of my leaf, there are 7,200 stomata.